just sorry for the slow uh, start. Um, a few urgent things have come up this week, so I had to change my talk just a little bit. So I'll talk a little more about some of the applied things that we've done after showing a few highlights of some of the fundamental work that we've done. Um, now I've got to get my slide to advance, uh, which should work. Uh, we're really privileged, privileged at LBNL to have a long history in both aconides and use of what we would consider large user facilities. And that kind of started all with Ernest O. Lawrence and the cyclotrons and is carried through to the advanced light source and other user facilities at LBNL. And of course, Glenn T. Seaborg in heavy element chemistry, who uh, you know, to set the tone for so much of what happens at LBNL even to this day. So the idea of you know doing science with the synchrotron, especially with heavy element materials, is to do the fundamental work. We take do the chemistry and we take materials to synchrotron radiation sources. And today, what I'll talk about is the work that we've done at the advanced light source, a third generation source that is located at LBNL, so it's very easy for us to work up to there. And then what comes out of that is information that allows us to get fundamental understanding of the systems that we're investigating. So that's really our idea is to really primarily do that. I'll talk about our work in scanning transmission X-ray microscopy today. I'm not gonna talk about any of our uh, photon out work or X-ray emission or RICs. And I've chosen uh, to just briefly go through a few of our highlights in fundamental science, but then how that set the tone for us to get involved with nuclear forensics, and then talk about some work that we're working on right now, which has to do with the examination of UO2 spent fuel. Then I'll, I'll simply conclude very briefly. Uh, you know, why, I guess one of the things everyone asks is why is heavy element science so important? Well, it's very easy to think about the military and defense applications. You can also think that it's important in nuclear nonproliferation and in forensics. As we all know that uh, the heavy elements are enjoying a resurgence in health and nuclear medicine uh, that intimately involves chemistry. Uh, we also know that it involves energy and particularly clean energy uh, as far as nuclear power and that there are advanced advancements in nuclear power and small modular reactors that have the ability to really be game changers in what we do in the world. And then we also have considerations of uh, heavy elements in the environment, whether they're directly related to the actinides or not. Uh, Fukushima Daiichi shows us, you know, issues in environment, as well as, you know, things that happen at the Hanford Reservation. So there's a really whole load of social impact of heavy element chemistries on our society and on our world. And so it's really important to be able to bring powerful tools in to address these issues. And here is, a, I guess, the prerequisite periodic table of the elements. And it highlights kind of uh, the actinide series down here, uh, the ones that we can actually do experiments with. And that the ALS being a third generation source really optimized in the soft x-rays, we really can directly access some of the light elements that interact with the actual actinides that are very, very important in their chemistry and are deterministic of their reactivity. So it's an, an ideal place to essentially do uh, light element studies. Now the ALS, although it's a, you know, primarily a soft x-ray source, has hard x-rays, tender x-rays, and uh, if you're old, you remember intermediate x-rays. And what it is, is really optimized in the soft x-rays. Uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have world-class photons up to 30 kilovolts, depending on the beam line you work at. And so you can see here, there are about over 40 beam lines at the ALS that do a range of work. And we use them for several different, many different beam lines for different purposes for actinide science. And I'm just gonna talk about one aspect of that today. Uh, and our, our real point has been to really focus on the electronic structure and bonding of actinides and light elements. And the idea is to use micro and nano spectroscopy to limit the uh, safety hazards. And what we always try to do is couple strongly to the theory and calculation, although 
uh, kind of the ongoing work I'm showing you today, we don't, we are not quite there yet on that. And like I said, today I'm going to talk about our XAS work using the scanning transmission X-ray microscope. We've done a lot of work in fluorescence spectroscopy and XES and RICS. Uh, and we, you know, we examine actinide metal edges, although today that won't be a, a, a real focus. But what we really like to do is look at the light atom or use ligand K-edge spectroscopy. Everyone here is familiar uh, with you know, the processes shown on the right. And like I say, today I'm really going to focus on our XAS work rather than any of our fluorescence out work. And so this is a, a schematic of the scanning transmission X-ray microscope at LBNL. And you can look on the left and you can see that uh, X-rays come down and be a soft X-ray beam line. Uh, they go through a silicon nitride window. They impinge on a zone plate, which you can kind of think of as a circular diffraction grating. They go through an order sorting aperture and then they go to a uh, photomultiplier detector in the back. And we simply scan our sample, it's a scanning microscope, scan it very quickly with high fidelity uh, over the nanometer range. And what makes this very challenging is that, you know, the focal length is very short, so you have to have really good command and control. Uh, the nice part is that it, it can run ambient, so you don't necessarily have to pump it down to vacuum. So for actinides, what we do is we actually, as you see on the lower left here, we actually put the actinide materials in between two silicon nitride membranes, and then we're able to image through the silicon nitride. And this allows us to contain samples very easily. Uh, there are some other methods we use as well, but this is the traditional one. And then what we end up with is we can actually uh, get a digital stack, in other words, a XY uh, absorption uh, at several different energies from 390 out to 430 in this example. And we can designate an area where we're going to collect the eye signal from, say, looking in the green here and kind of the background in red. And we can digitally reconstruct any point uh, amongst those scans. And we can scan with about, uh, I'd say, about uh, 25 nanometer resolution on a usual day. And at this beam line, uh, we can run from about 100 up to about 100 EV up to about two kilovolts. And our resolution is better than uh, 10,000, which is uh, really outstanding. This was a beam line that uh, was built under my auspices, uh, became functional in 2003. Uh, one of the things that we really excel at here, and it's been an important thing, is really doing ligand K-edge X-ray absorption. Uh, I refer you to this article by Solomon, Hedman, and Hodgson, uh, which is a great review. But what we've done is translated that down into low energies. Uh, and here you can see the idea that you can actually understand if you, you know, the transitions. You can get out the electronic structure. And this is really given by you know, the ratios of the pre-edge transitions in these materials. And so if you look here, you can see the whole basis for um, ligand K-edge X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And so we've taken advantage of that to, to examine materials, uh, starting with the oxygen edge. On the left here uh, is another uh, interesting student uh, who was a postdoc and student. And this is looking at the tetrahedral perennate ion and comparing it, the Stixum response to that from other, uh, other experimental means, uh, bulk, and then even NRICs. But you can see the Stixum response is very, very nice and it's rather simple. And on the right here is a, is a real tour de force who was done by Stefan Manassin, who's now a staff member with us, uh, looking at a set of tetra, I mean, of MO4s, oxides, and looking at the pre-edges here. And you can see uh, they're arranged as in the periodic table, as you go down and to the right, you can see the ratios of those pre-edges change. And that just gives you information on the covalency and shows that there's increasing mixing as you go down and to the right as you'd expect. So that's a very simple summary. It was a real uh, experimental triumph and great care. Now we can do that with oxygen and we can also do it with carbon. And this is a, a work that we also did. A lot of this work is in partnership with Los Alamos as well. 
And here you can see uh, the experimental results for thoracine and uranosine. This is at the carbon K edge, so it's a much more difficult experiment. Uh, and you see the experiment compared to TDDFT done by Enrique Batista and company and Rich Martin. And what I like to highlight here is that you can actually break down the specific transitions uh, that lead to the total signal. You can see that the fit for the uranosine is very good. We have troubles modeling the, the, the lead feature in the thoracine. But I call your attention to the second panel here and these E3U uh, transitions, which are characteristic of a phi orbital mixing. And you can see that you have a lot of that in thoracine, a little bit less in uranosine, and that's a little, that's unexpected, but uh, it can be rationalized when you go back and you look at the situation and take into account some of the geometries. But this was a, another nice uh, study um, that was done. And then what I really wanted to highlight in this talk, but I didn't have time to prepare all of them, is really some of the nitrogen K-edge work that we've done. And this is work that was spearheaded by Thomas Dumas and Christoph Denauer, and this took a long time to do. And here we're looking at the nitrogen K edge in several materials here, and we're using this nice hexacyanoferrate system, which is nice because it puts all the nitrogens around the actinide or metal ion. And here you can see for some rare earths on over here, and on the far right, you can see it for the actinides. In the rare earths, you can see there's very, very little interaction. And of course, in the actinides, you see uh, much more interaction as you get to the heavier actinides. And this is just reflective of uh, increased transitions to the 5F, 6D uh, kind of hybridized band in those materials. And this, again, was yeah, Thomas Dumas did a fantastic job on this. And uh, this was a real um, tour de force, again, on the Stixum. And I think just uh, you know to, to show about uh, some nanoscience, this is work done with Thomas Dumas and Sergei Nikotinko. And this was looking at sonochemical colloids compared to hydrolytic colloids. And here they were distributed on the silicon nitride windows. Over here, you can see in the normal contrast, you can see where they are. And then in, down here in the plutonium map, you can see them in white. You know, the benefit of Stixum is we're able to zoom in and look at some of those edges, although they're, I mean, some of those particles, although they're aggregated, and get out spectra. In the sonochemicals collide, you, you see that this pre-edge region uh, really resembles more of plutonium dioxide than anything else. And the hydrolytic colloid that we examined, it's much more, um, looks like a much more mixed situation with other oxide species around. And so this really tells you that the sonochemical colloid is being, you know, it's reforming that interface, makes a better interface, makes better material. The one thing this just points out is we need better spatial resolution if we really want to do some complicated nanoscience uh, studies. And so this brings into the whole idea of uh, doing tachography. On the left, there's an image of uh, kind of how you do tachography in a theoretical a uh, picture of how you would improve that transmission image. Uh, here we did this at a, B, at a new beam line, not at 1102. You can see what the uh, spectra look like at these various edges that we took for a uh, uranium fluoride. And on the right, you can look at a, a tachography image compared to a Stixum image, and you can see the improvement by using tachography. Um, and again, this, this Stixum image is not as nearly as good as it should be, but it gives you the idea of how, what kind of resolution you can get if you use tachography down to about three nanometers. Um, Jerry, I'm happy. I'm, I think I'm at a good stopping spot if there are any questions. Um, uh, no questions. Well, no questions yet. I'll, I'll ask one. Um, in, the, uh, in the tachography, mm -hmm. how easy or hard is it to do that spectroscopically uh, in the sense of, you know, go, go through a pre-edge feature or do you have to just pick and choose in the spirit of uh, resonant XES where you, you, you pick one energy and do the tychography, then pick another energy and do the tychography? No, you can, you can, you, you have the same flexibility that you have doing regular stitchum. Okay. So you can, you can do energies and what's, you know, more comp, you know, it's being developed is being able to extract out all the, all the spectroscopic information. It can be done, but it, you know it's it's 
it's being developed, uh, whereas the imaging is the, is the simplest part. I see, okay. Yeah, so um, you, we, are, you, are, you are able to go through and extract spectroscopic information as well. Okay, we have a question from Satish. Um, sorry, um, David, I have a quick question related to the nitrogen next apps you shared. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, is the, the peaks correspond to the 1S2 like PF mixed orbitals or yes. is it mostly the ligand P's? Um, it's the, they're coupled to the ligand P's. And, and the ligand P's for some of them are, are, are well, no, you're, you're using the light element mixing uh, going to the PDF orbitals. And, and I know, I, I, I think in the slide you showed some spectral fitting. So what do the, you know, the peak widths mean for those different actinide complexes? Okay, so, so some of those, um, you just, they, they just show the energy spread and they show the resolution that we're able to obtain. Uh, and, the, and it's an area, it's a, you can try and coordinate that. I mean, you determine it to the percentage of uh, that sort of bonding, right? Yeah. So you, you, you can get an idea of how much is FD and how much might just be purely D. Yeah, so I'm can, just curious, yeah, whether you did any theoretical calculations to compare those, that's... Yeah. Yes, we, we have such each, I just didn't show them. Okay, hey, thank you though. Sorry, I was muted. Um, uh, uh, Sharon Bone, would you like to ask your question? Oh, sure. Um, I was interested if you could just say a little bit more about how it, why it's difficult to extract spectroscop spectroscopic information with tychography. Um, I'm not familiar with the technique and I've heard that that's the case, but I don't sort of understand the details of where the difficulty lies. And, you know, I'm just wondering. Well, so the tychography was originally developed mostly for imaging and to get improved imaging. I'm not an expert at extracting out the the spec, you still can go in and get the spectroscopic information out. It's not a, I, I don't believe it's a big issue. We, we've done it just briefly here in this example I gave you. And I just know that the team at the ALS is, is working, is, you know, has worked on that and is, is going forward. I can't give you a, a real detailed analysis of that. Okay, but when you do the tychography here, you are generating sort of the same sort of stack maps where every pixel you have the spectra. And so like, ideally you could do the yes. whole thing. Okay. I believe that's correct, yeah. And can you, sorry, one more follow-up question. Can you compare the length of time for to collect the same tychography stack map versus sticks image? <sighs> okay, so that, yeah, that's a, that's a, a detailed question because you, you know, tychography doesn't use, uh, you know, you, you, you fatten your, you make it use a larger beam so that you can get better statistics more quickly. So there's a trade-off there. Generally, I would, you know, generally tychography takes longer. It depends on your exact system. For, for our actinide systems, it, it takes a substantial amount of time. Okay. Uh, Melissa, you had a question? No, I just wanted to say, tychography, I think the problem with getting spectroscopic information is you have to use different wavelengths. That means you'd have to have a stack of images. And taking, recording these kind of, of images takes a long time because you have to oversample the sample because you have a phase problem. So this is why in the image you see all these circles. Yes, because you have to overlap each of the beam spots across your sample. And otherwise uh, you can't, uh, you can't resolve your image. Yes, so if you wanted to have spectroscopic information, an overlay of your tychography images, you'd have to go back and repeat all those at different wavelengths. And then you start having problems with your sample surviving, um, especially if you're looking at carbonaceous material in the soft X-ray regime. Um, yeah. Um, but I think this is probably the biggest challenge, yeah? Yeah, But yes. there's other things, what I wanted to ask in this particular case, and the, the stick them image, you can you can bundle pixels and there's things you can do that you could probably get something that looks very similar to this tychography image here, yeah? And are these spectra really from those stacks of, of different energies, images? Because then I think this is really very impressive. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I believe that these were these these are not the tychography extracted spectrum. Okay. But the, the, your point is well taken there, Melissa, because it does take a substantial amount of time. And it's the, the issue with fragile samples is the tremendous photon exposure. Thank you, David. Okay. One, one last question in this session from Brandy. I think Matthew answered my question, but I was just kind of curious about the upper uh, end of the energy range for Stixum. Uh, you mean at existing microscopes at the ALS? Yeah, exactly. Like if you're looking for elements and, and looking through it at what different, what their different electron energies are, I'm curious, yeah, kind of how high up the Stixum can go. Well, I mean, the 1102 Stixum is good to about 2000 EV. Uh, you know, the, the newer Stixums go through the, the sulfur edge at the, at the ALS. So 532.1, right, uh, can go up to higher energy. If I got the number right, the, the newer sticks them at 532. Okay, yeah. great. But the, that, that one is not available to users, and uh, I don't know when it will be finally commissioned. Right, so that's a priority. Right, I agree, Matthew, so no problem. So yeah. the new one, the tender one is going to have the... Um, sort of the same resolution as the current Stixums, but it's gonna go up higher in energy. Yeah, it'll go up to eight kilovolts. Yeah, Very at least that's the plan. With Great. slightly less resolution to start probably. Yeah, it'll be uh, tychographic. So uh, it'll, uh, the resolution will depend on all uh, a number of variables. Yeah, so yeah. sample survival being the high priority. All right, that'll have to be a topic for another talk once that's commissioned. That would be great. Um, with that, uh, uh, you should continue with your talk, David. All right. Uh, so the other the other thing that we became interested after these fundamental studies was really how we might really apply the Stixum to some real world problems. And this kind of came up in one of our, we helped someone do an experiment from our nuclear sciences division. We gave them a bunch of Neptunium dioxide, and they ran off and did nuclear resonant fluorescence. And uh, they came back and said, wow, from our results, that wasn't pure NPO2. Well, we, this was some archived NPO2. And uh, we took it upon ourselves to think, well, instead of going back and doing the counting on it, nuclear counting, we would take some of the particles and put them in the sticks and analyze them. And so we did this. And, uh, you know, we could see that there was an impurity in it and it turned out to be silicon here. Uh, but it was a nice way to, to use the Stixum as an analytical tool for the first time. And it, it kind of gave us the idea that we should be really doing a few more things with, with the Stixum. And so this kind of led us into the nuclear forensics area where we thought that we could use the Stixum to use soft X-rays to do particle morphology uh, at the end edges, do some radioisotope quantification, but really use the light atom uh, ligand K edge uh, to do some light atom speciation. So this became a, a, an interesting effort for us. Uh, and this required us to do a lot of particle handling that we were already good at. And again, at, at Berkeley, we can do this fairly well. Um, and this just goes to show you kind of how we do some of the work in preparing the materials. Uh, one of the things that we realized that really had to happen for Stixum that hadn't, and this was done by Joe Packwold, was kind of developing a, an interface to the Stixum so that we could go through and hunt particles that we really wanted to find and find particles that were of appropriate thickness because you have to use very thin samples, especially with actinides. So uh, this turns out to be a very useful program. You'll see it running on several Stixums. And the, the type of information you can get out that might be useful for forensics here, you can see a normal image up here. You can see a calcium, oxygen, and uranium map. Uh, but you can importantly get out spectra at each one of these edges here. And you can see calcium, oxygen, and the uranium N, N edge. 
uh, and you can go about trying to you know, get understanding the electronic structure to give you some uh, signatures of what you've got in your material. And you know, of, of importance is you can actually do some, uh, you can differentiate uh, fluorine materials from the fluorine K edge. And here you see an example of that. Uh, and you can discriminate amongst the different uh, fluorine species. Uh, and here's one where we kind of had a failed experiment. We've made a mechanical mixture of UO2F2 and UO2. And the UO2F2 that we have is, is not necessarily pristine, but you can see that on these different areas of, of the stixum, uh, you can see different response. And so you might have different mixtures here. And the reason I don't show you a, an improved map here is because this wasn't entirely successful, but this is something that we definitely can do. But this was one of our early on uh, experiences with this. Uh, and what we really wanted to do after some point was actually look at some uh, real forensic materials. And so we were uh, kind enough to get these materials from Mike Christo, who was kind enough to give them to us. And these were materials that had already been, uh, had forensic analysis published on it. Um, the nice part is we didn't look up and any of the forensic information until after our experiment. And so our goal was to really evaluate the morphology and homogeneity. And we did, we took these powders that you see here and uh, put them on silicon nitride windows. And these were materials that were essentially obtained in Australia as a result of uh, some material, uh, some crime investigations, and they found these materials and they, they did the analysis on them. And so of this one type, you can see it had about two micron particles. We could do the normal contrast imaging. And here are the uh, false color images of uranium, oxygen, and carbon. We could inspect it for lots of other light element uh, contamination. And we're able to really determine the composition here, uh, essentially from the spectra. And again, it's nice here. It's, it's, we can see the carbon, which is difficult to see by many other ways. And then we actually could compare this to the results. And the results uh, you know, uh, were primarily looked like hydrated uh, UO3. Uh, and again, what you know, you, one has to do is you go through, and these are some essentially oxygen edge uh, libraries that have been ge generated by several individuals. Uh, we have a library as well that we've developed over the years, but these were the ones that were existing before we started doing this work. And so you can see here for all the classes of the uranium materials, the oxygen edge really gives you a nice uh, signature as to what the material might be. And so, you know, the one thing when we did look at these particles that we could see that each particle, there was great heterogeneity in all these particles. And here you can see the oxygen K edge spectra from each one of these particles over here. Uh, and generally it fits to reference hydrated UO3. Uh, you know, there are, you know, these different variants also give, you know, show that there are different water concentrations on these materials and that there may be some U307 in these materials. And so this is just uh, what we can do within the forensics window. And then the other thing that we did, uh, again, with Livermore here, was we got interested in doing fib sections. We had been doing them before, and they had a fib section of some UO2 that had been compacted and then aged. And here there's a fib section. So if you look on this fib section, up here, this is the platinum. Up here, this is the interfacial area of uranium. And this is the bulk area. And, and these are voids here. And so we're able to go in. And this material wasn't crystalline. So in TM analysis, they couldn't figure out uh, which phase it was. And so we could go in and examine it with stixum and in the bulk area and in the surface area. And you can see the spectra here and the blue spectra is really uh, characteristic of Chopite, whereas the bulk is much more characteristic of uh, a UO2, U307 intermediate. And if you do the false color image on this based on those spectra, you can see that at these interfacial areas where it was aged, you see the hot, you see the 
kind of show pie, even on the internal void areas, you can see where that blue that blue show pipe tends to show up. So this really gave us a lot of impetus to really want to do more work with fib sections. And so this leads us to, uh, you know, I just want to share some of our ongoing work with you up on uh, nuclear fuels and basically uh, really measuring real fuels with some spatial resolution is a real good way to look at uh, what's going on in the fuels, how things are, are taking place, and it's critical to design better fuels. So we're working with a team from INL and uh, Claude de Bigri, and uh, we started to look at these. And again, you know, UO2 uh, fuels are basically, uh, you know, they're fluoride in structure as they, uh, you know, as UO2 essentially oxidizes, it goes through this pattern. There's a great paper down here on the right by Leanders that has really addressed some of these issues. And you can see that people have looked, like I've said before, at many of the different oxygen cages of many materials. But the idea is, uh, you know, these green guys kind of grow in as things oxidize. But we, we were really interested in see if we could add to the discussion here uh, on nuclear fuels. And so what happened is our colleagues at INL used a focus ion beam to suction some of these low burn up spent nuclear fuels, uh, basically for TEM. But the, the thicknesses for TEM turn out to be really ideal for soft x-rays. And so here you just see the whole lift out process and you can see what the uh, lamella that you end up with, the thin section here that's on the order of 200 nanometers thick. And so these you know, were shipped to us from INL. Uh, INL of course did a TEM on them. This is 20 nanometers resolution. You can see their uh, elemental maps down here for many species. You can see kind of the bubbles in the samples uh, that come, you know, that are imaged by the TEM, which is really nice. Uh, but what I really want to focus on is, you know, what do these look like in the Stixum? And again, these came from a Belgian reactor, uh, FIB and TEM at INL, and we looked at uh, several grids. And the nice part when you look at one of these lamella is that there are about 42 picocuries each. Uh, well, pardon me, they're, they're, yeah, they're about 42 picocuries each, so they're no problem. We don't even have to put these in a silicon nitride window to run them in the Stixum. So it makes it very nice and they're very stable and they, they hold together and they're mounted on, a, of course, on a TEM grid. Uh, you know, the big question here is, if you have a solid sample, how do you really do your normalization correctly? Uh, and so this is a big issue that we realized. And we also realized that we have to be careful with uh, the access program uh, because it, we, we can be tremendously sensitive to thickness uh, differences in these um, TM uh, fib sections. And so the question is how to really normalize in these. And these are some of the issues we're, we're still dealing with. Um, this is what. Uh, one of the sections look like here. This is a fuel section. You can see that it has an upside down, this upside down halo here, and that's just a void in the, the TEM section, um, in, the, in the FIB section. And again, I flipped it, it's flipped over here, but we essentially took spectra from 0.1 out to six. You know, what's nice about this is that we actually have a discontinuity in the, in the FIB section here, so we can actually use that to help us to do the normalization. And down on the right here, you see the, the, the oxygen K edge spectra that are obtained at each point for those uh, series of steps out away from that uh, void. And what's really nice is that you notice on these spectra that there are isobestic points in this. And so this generally only happens when you have mixtures of a couple materials. And of course, you know what happens with this, you can do PCA on it. And uh, you know that things have, you know, the mixture has, you know, similar values because you just have to get the coefficients right. And it's really unlikely that three unrelated spectra would really have the same values at, at any one point. Uh, so we started working with this a, a little bit. And you can, of course, uh, look at 
what composes your endpoints. Uh, and then the two extreme regions, one and six, are plotted against standards. And one looks like U02, the other looks like U307, except that they're just a little bit off of stoichiometry. Uh, so uh, our endpoints aren't quite perf the perfect standards here, but this is what, uh, you know, the asterisk shows you what we're using as our endpoints. Um, oops, wrong way. And so what we're able to do is to use to make uh, species maps around this little halo. And for UO2, you can see that the UO2 shows up away from the halo whereas the U307 shows up right next to the halo, as you rather reasonably expect. Um, here, uh, this is another region in the, the FIB section where there is a small discontinuity as well sitting here. And you can see the UO2 is, is concentrated away from the discontinuity and it's perfectly clear from this analysis that the U307 is essentially ringing this little tear in the uh, fib section. So that's really interesting, uh, showing you that you know what's happening actually in the, the spent fuel pin. Uh, and on the left here, this is another area in, in, in one of the fib sections. And you can see this is the normal image here. Uh, and you can see that there's some cracking, intergranular cracking. Here you can see the uranium map uh, from TEM. And here you can see the rhodium map. So you can see some of the, the particulate sizes that show up. And on the right here, we can go in and, and use our method. And you can see that the UO2 is distributed to the right here. And you see the U307 again is distributed along these crack and intergranular areas preferentially. Uh, so I, I think I'm going to make it through here, Jerry, uh, without a second break, unless you want to stop. Now. We've got one. We've got one question. It's a really good one. So let's okay, pause so for that. Go ahead, uh, Melissa. Do you want to ask your uh, fusion question? Yeah, I um, thank you, David. I love these kind of uh, uh, studies. Yeah, so it's very difficult to to look at spent fuel with spectroscopic techniques, but by using microscopy, you're using the advantage of having small volumes. And so you're, you, you pointed out the, the low activities that makes it doable. And this is very good. I'm just wondering if you've had a chance to look at any spent mock samples or some activated fusion uh, samples, or how are these early days and you, you're concentrating on on, on uranium spent fuels at the moment? Uh, so uh, that's a really great question. So I can tell you we've, we've examined some uranium nitride fuels. Uh, we're still working on that. Uh, you know, we're a little limited now in <laughs> doing experiments because of, of COVID, but uh, we, do, we do wanna look at some slightly more active uranium-based fuels, and we do want to look at some uh, materials that have substantial amount of plutonium in them. So that would be your MOX question. Yes, we'd like to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're also, we need to be able to normalize. We're, we're learning how to do this. Uh, but yes, that's, we are hopeful of being able to do that. Yeah, because I think when you start maybe looking at transmutation targets and things like this, that looking at MOX and uranium fuel is going to be a, a good benchmark. And um, let's hope that the world moves forward to start doing things like this and make nuclear energy safer and sustainable. Thank you. Well, good question. And yeah, you're uh, just don't get too far ahead of us. <laughs> uh, one, one more question this break from Carolyn Pierce, please. Hi, David. I'm really enjoying your presentation. Um, I'm just really interested about these oxidation effects that you're seeing sort of relatively deep within the samples and, and wondered if you had any idea of the mechanism of oxidation of UR2 to show by it in those pores and if you had any oh. about the beam effects in those areas where the sample is very thin. Okay, so you're going back to the Livermore TEM sample. So they were compacted and then they were aged. And again, they were compacted 
and you can they had some internal voids and where they put the platinum down was certainly an interfacial area and they they had examined this by TEM and they they could get out a ratio an oxygen uranium ratio but they couldn't do any diffraction on them because they were slightly amorphous right that's what happens and so uh, uh, they have the details of this of these experiments uh, I think if you look you may be able to find a report uh, that details some of the results uh, from those experiments. They concluded a, a year or two ago, and I don't know, I have not seen the report. But that's all I can say, because it was a, it's a, an NNSA uh, funded work, so it will show up in a report that is publicly accessible. I'll check it out, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, there'll be more questions at the end. You should continue, David. All right, so I'm almost done. So, uh, you know, one of the things we have to, you know, be careful about uh, with these fib sections is they are shipped over, they're fib, and they're sent to us. And it's possible that, the, you know, these samples could be oxidized on the surface a little more, uh, you know, after, you know, following the radiation. Uh, you know, there is some different literature examples show different spectra for UO2. We happen to have one that we haven't put in this data yet. We have a sample from Livermore that's been carefully, carefully prepared to be very stoichiometric UO2 uh, because we know there are lots of UO2 or close to UO2 uh, phases. Uh, and then we've done some work doing PCA and other techniques and we have to be careful because sometimes we get negative coefficients and those that's not allowable and it shows you we don't quite have the right UO2 spectrum. And so, um, you know, thanks to Jerry's excellent training of Alex Ditter, Alex has really embarked on doing some of this work. Uh, again, going a little bit beyond what uh, Chris Jacobson has done in his application and uh, so he's using some non-negative matrix factorization techniques that have just started to be implemented on this. And uh, again, uh, we're in the process of this and you can see that, uh, you know, there's some, a, a little bit of preliminary data that says that we might have a, a combination of materials, but essentially the uh, kind of the distribution show up about the same uh, we need to further work on this. And again, it's the, the real key is doing the, back, a real key is doing the background subtraction correctly. But otherwise we end up with, uh, you know, negative numbers, which don't make any sense. So uh, this is something that we're working on. I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what we were doing because we think this is a, a real valuable way to proceed for stick some studies uh, at all energies now and into the future. Um, then the last slide I, I, I want to show is just, uh, you know, that, you know, we've always been thinking towards tender uh, with spectral microscopy. This is a, a slide that I've had long before uh, the ALS decided on a, a flagship intermediate or tender x-ray uh, beamline. And these are some of the things that you could really think about doing in uh, although I haven't spoken to Herf D or Ricks here, uh, we've certainly done a lot of that with collaborators and it would be really a great thing to implement here. And then the other thing is it really gives us a, an, a platform for time resolved experiments as well. And the larger working distance makes life a lot easier. Uh, and then some of the things that you that you probably already know is when you go to tender x-rays, you get the M45 edges. You kind of get phosphorus, chlorine, and sulfur get thrown in. Uh, you can do a lot of the lanthanide L edges, and then you also have access to some of the transition metal K edges. And Matthew, you can correct me. Uh, uh, the ALS upgrade, hopefully people will be using it in 20, about 2025. Uh, I, Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah, it's 2025 or 2026, and I'm being optimistic. And uh, they did, uh, at least they did get CD2. Yeah, and so they've just got CD2, and that number's more well-known publicly now. But uh, this is something I think that 
everyone can look forward to. And, you know, there are a number of Stixums operating well at, at the ALS, but this would be a, you know, a nice, having the spatial resolution and flux uh, resulting from the ALSU and tender x-rays would is certainly going to be a game changer in, in this area. And so we want to work to develop the infrastructure and the methods to do this. Um, and so I, I'll just kind of conclude here. Uh, in uh, forensics and nuclear safeguards, we can get spatially resolved light element signatures and materials that are in particles and other materials that are important for these efforts. Uh, you know, we've done some characterization of interdicted specimens. Uh, we have a publication that needs to go out on this. And I, I showed just kind of the leading edge of that. And then the other thing is that, uh, you know, stick some in is a, might be a really great way to study some of the oxidation properties of active ion materials. Again, not so much from the metal side, but looking from the ligand K edge side in. Uh, and then I think I've shown you kind of our ongoing uh, work on uh, UO2 based uh, nuclear fuels that have been irradiated using, again, the oxygen K edge. And this, I think, is the first one of its type in soft X ray spectrum microscopy. And our oxygen maps show more complex oxides near the defects uh, in these, in these uh, fuel pins sections. And uh, not quite as much near intergranular cracking, but we still see it there. And we have some questions about how we are establishing our endpoint spectra for, you know, figuring out how to really uh, firmly correlate the isobestic points and standards. And so we're working on that. And again, uh, Alex is really working hard on getting the backgrounding techniques for these uh, these FIB sections under control and new ways to actually do uh, analysis of them kind of extended beyond principal component analysis. Um, with that, you know, this is not the work of any single individual. This is what you've seen is uh, kind of a, a whole lot of work by a lot of people. And so I really want LB and LA want to acknowledge Travis Bray, who did a lot of the Neptunium work. Alex Ditter, who's currently a postdoc with me. Uh, Stefan Manassi, who was a postdoc and staff member who did a lot of the uh, pioneering work in the, in the ligand K edge area. And Joe Packle, who kind of tied everything together uh, for a long time there. And Daniel Smiles, who did a lot, who did carried along the forensics work. All of our ALS scientists uh, uh, that contributed to this work that I presented here, Many other ALS scientists, we continue to, we're working with new ones as well. And at INL, Lin Feng He and his team that really helped us get that uh, nuclear, irradiated nuclear fuel lamella and Claude de Bridry, who uh, was part of that team as well. Uh, we did a lot of work with HZDR uh, on the plutonium work. And of course, Los Alamos, we've, we collaborate on many of these studies with and then Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for a lot of the standard materials and helping us uh, get into the uh, forensics and safeguards areas. And on the right here, this is the plutonium nano team, as well as part of the, uh, the uh, actinide cyanoferrate team, uh, Sergei Nikotinko, a lot of work by Thomas Dumas and Christoph Denauer, along with their team. Uh, and finally, that it, it goes without saying that none of this would happen without funding from uh, BES and the Heavy Element Chemistry Program. Uh, of course, part of the work that you saw today is, was supported by the NNSA, uh, NA22, and parts of this work were also sponsored by LDRD at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And everything I showed you today really used the resources of the Advanced Light Source, uh, which is also supported by the US DOE. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. And uh, it's nice getting to give a talk here. So Jerry, thank you very much. My pleasure and thank you for giving the seminar. That was terrific. Um, first, uh, Tanya Vitova, you have a question? Hi, David. Uh, 
congratulations. It's really impressive your, the work on uh, spent nuclear fuel, particularly. Uh, so I have a question. I think you partially answered it that um, the sample was in earth gas atmosphere or in vacuum, and you try to keep it not oxidized. But uh, maybe you said, I think, that it might be partially oxidized. And uh, did you have any sign for uranium 6? I think you said mixture of U308 and U2, but uh, I'm not that, uh, that much of an expert of oxygen KH sense, so I'm not sure if you're completely sure that you well, didn't I'm not sure uranium 6. I'm not sure that you're not an expert at some of those things. But anyway, no. So <laughs> I, I think the best answer I can give you is if you go through and you look at the contribution of the surface, near surface areas in those FIBs compared to the bulk, and it's, it's less than 10%. So okay. we're primarily getting bulk information. Could there be uh, some uh, contribution? Yes, there could be, but we're not, at least we don't see it. But again, it's, it's less than 10% from our initial calculations. So we don't think we're experiencing bad uh, oxidation program oxidation problems on these samples. Now, if they were three years old or two years old, that might be another issue. But you know, these have been pretty well cared for. Okay, so you try to keep them not oxidized, but of course, yes. eventually it might have happened. Okay. Yeah, right. Because we saw well, some uranium six in some samples, but we are not sure if it was uh, a maybe. Um, adjust from another source, um, contamination of the sample, for example. So it's not supposed to be there, but uh, we saw it. So that's why I was curious if you maybe uh, saw uranium 6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, well, I mean, like I say, we, we wouldn't, it, it'd be less for us. It would be kind of, it would, we might see it. We might not see it. And again, what we, we are seeing are, we're getting more bulk information than anything else. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. It was really very interesting, exciting. Thank you. All right. Question from Richard. Uh, hello. Um, I was just wondering that your sample preparation is made quite easy for powdered samples since you have a really small beam, so your sample does not need to be homogeneous of a large range. And I was wondering if it is possible to prepare a homogeneous powder sample in a soft X-ray range um, over a larger range, let's say a millimeter or so. Over how, what size? I couldn't hear that at last. And so let's say a millimeter or 100 micrometers. So the, the range doesn't really matter. I was just wondering if it's possible or if there are some methods to prepare the sample in a way. Yeah, you, you, you have a good, you, you bring up a good question. So, um, you know, we're always, I think we're, depending on the sample, we're always amazed when it's, kind of homogeneous. And when it's heterogeneous, we're sometimes surprised too. So uh, I think it all depends on the material, how you treat it. I mean, um, and I, I mean, I, I'm sure you, you could find a material that would be entirely uniform. I mean, if you make a thin, you know, a thin film or, you know, we do this, you do what, you know, people like to call as drop casting, right? So we can end up with larger areas that are you know, that are essentially the same, but you have to have, it, it really depends on the material and how it's prepared. Um, I certainly think there, you probably could do that. Um, you know, you, the other thing to do is you can get, um, you know, you can get materials that are nanoparticles that are, you know, are supposed to have all the same composition or largely the same composition. So, yeah, I, I, I think that can be done. I think you have to have care and in all these systems, like I say, we, we're always amazed at when things are always, you know, nothing like everything isn't the same or my gosh, it looks the same. So it, it, it is, um, I guess that's the best answer I can give. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'll ask just one last question. Um, uh, so you have sometimes limited flux as a consequence of using the, uh, the zone plates and whatnot, and that'll certainly improve with the upgrade as you get higher brilliance. That being said, um, do you think you're photon starved for possibly having an XES detection mode with Stixum? And if so, have you considered transition ed sensor arrays for the detection option? 
Okay, so I, I, I am aware of the, so, so on the 1102 sticks, I mean, we actually throw away some flux mm -hmm. because it's just too much. Um, you know, as you go to, you know, I think that's more of a question for intermediate. You're, are you specifically talking about tender? It could be soft also. They've done a, a soft XES and RICS with the TES arrays. Yeah, no, I, I'm familiar with the TES arrays, but mm -hmm. the issue with the TES arrays usually is the is the cryogenic coupling is difficult. Well, it's pretty pretty standard these days, but um, yeah, but to get it on a vibration on a uh, I see, I see, a I vibration, understand. You don't want to be vibrating stuff. Okay, difficult. okay, okay. So I, I think there's some complexities there. Yeah, but we are we are aware of the the TES uh, detectors. I think that you know certainly in the tender X-ray region you'll, you'll you'll have sufficient flux, and you have sufficient cross sections uh, at the M edges there of the actinides. So I think that's a, a really great experiment. And then Herfty, of course, is great there regardless, uh, and there'll be no there's no issue with flux there. As you go down in energy, I, I think it's going to take, um, yeah, with the with the zone plate, it's a little more question. It's it's a yeah, you're kind of on the edge. Yeah, uh, Math, Matthew edge. has pointed out that there's uh, spatial constraints, and right. that of course, of course, there'd be engineering challenges in integrating it with a stick some vacuum chamber and whatnot for uh, for lower energies. But yeah, that's, at, the, at the soft x-rays, you have very little clearance between the sample and the OSA. So it's really hard to get anything out. In tender, yeah. we are intending to put in a fluorescent detector, but even that will be a challenge. Well, I, I think the, the, tender, the tender situation can be solved. The, the Stixum one is, you know, kind of lower energy is, is very challenging. Uh, for uh, for technical reasons, right? That's and again, it has to do when you go to the tender region. You just that the the working distance is so much better, and you know the 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 containment and the containment issue is less, right? And you don't have to worry. You're working. You know your your penetration lengths are becoming much larger. So, yeah, I think there are challenges in the soft for that, but. It, it can be, I, I think it, with enough effort, it, can, it could be overcome.